too often when we talk about communities, we talk about them as statistics or data, and we don't include their lived experiences in either the services that we bring or the results that we work to achieve. And that is how we fail. As development actors, as investors, that is how we fail. It is when we partner with those whose lives we are affecting that we make the right decisions about how we move forward. So yes, conversations with at every level from government to NGOs to community actors is quite important wherever you work in the world. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So me and Priscilla were talking just about food security in general and, you know, was wondering about, you know, how the pandemic has affected food security mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's rolled cost of living back in so many places. It must also be affecting food security. Very much so. We increased the number of people who are food insecure across the entire globe, including here in the United States as a result of the pandemic. Those places that had more vibrant social safety nets, that impact was and, and is temporary and was not as dramatic as we had feared. But in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, where the percentage of people who are food insecure was already high, the impacts of the pandemic have continued to persist on food security. You know, when we when we see areas still having famines in the world, you know, is there, I mean, it, it seems like this is a woman man made problem. You know, this is a problem of people, you know, that we still have this food security. I mean, what do you, how do you think about that? Well, we know that particularly when you talk about severe and acute food insecurity, there are, are two primary drivers today of acute food insecurity, and that is conflict. Places like Yemen, Syria, Northeast Nigeria, Somalia, Sudan, now Tigray in, in Ethiopia. And the other is, is climate. The most vulnerable people live in the most climate vulnerable places. And what we're seeing is places where the rains don't come, the short rains don't come, the long rains are now short rains. And that affects the acute spikes in food insecurity and the challenges of chronic food insecurity as well as malnutrition. You know, it seems like incredible to me that here we are, 21st century, we're still dealing with things that one would hope we could be solving. A problem like this, food insecurity, how do you even begin to think about this from your perspective, having sure. so much experience? What are some of the ways that you- I mean, what's, a, what's an ide ideal state for the world to be in? <laughs> an ideal state for the world to be in is that no child would ever go to bed hungry. Mm -hmm. That's an and not only would that child not go to bed hungry, that child would have access to the diverse and nutritious diet that is necessary to ensure their physical as well as their mental growth. That's the ideal state. Like food deserts in America, you know, mm -hmm. huge, huge problem where children may not even be aware of, you know, where a vegetable comes from. You know, how do how do you address problems like that? Is it that we're not all agreeing on what what is good? food? You know, is that a problem? That's a part of the problem. Food insecurity is basically divided and defined by three factors. One is availability of food. You will hear many people say that we grow enough food to feed the entire world. It is just about a distribution and transportation and logistics problem and how we grow more food for feed than we do for food with the commodity growth of food. But the reality is, and, and, and all of that's true, the Food and Agriculture Organization has done significant studies in this space, but the reality is that we have about 3 billion of the 7 billion people in the world who cannot afford a diverse and balanced diet. Being that they can't afford it at this point, isn't world population go, I mean, projections are for it to go up for another couple billion and then it says it's going to fall. I don't, I don't know whether that's true or not, but, but uh, I don't, nobody does. 
but but are we are we handling this idea? You know, it seems like the distribution of vaccines was kind of a first test and not a very, you know, we didn't pass it very well, you know? Yes, so there's an expectation that by 2050, we'll have nine and a half billion people on the planet. In order to meet the diverse, nutritious food needs of all of those people, it will require an exponential increase in the amount of food that we produce. Those are just facts. The challenge is that we, where populations are growing, places like Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, are the places where we also have in significant amounts of food insecurity today. And so the investment that is necessary to support the agricultural production in those areas is not sufficient. And that is what folks like me spend all of our waking time on, is how do we ensure that as we talk about creating a, a food system that is sustainable, and we, we also talk about making that food system just, which means that we need a food system that meets our environmental needs, our health needs, as well as the income uh, return needs for all actors across the food system. No, is the are these the kinds of things that you thought about growing up in Lawndale, or were you, uh, you know? I grew up in a food family. Okay, mm -hmm. my grandfather was a farm laborer on my mom's side. Mm -hmm. My dad and my grandmother, his mom, owned restaurants and and other food service businesses. My dad was a chef by training, and so food was a topic of conversation and mm -hmm. a lot of the work that we performed as children in in working with our parents. In our, in our family. And so I never thought I would sit as the U.S. representative for food and agriculture at the FAO. Which is Her Excellency, correct? Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I said, having grown up in Lawndale on Chicago's west side, the first time you are called Your Excellency and everyone stands, it is <laughs> yeah. it's quite a change. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a long way from Chicago's west side. But, but the reality is what I grew up with was a respect for the right to food yeah. and an understanding of the importance of healthy food. And so with that in mind, having worked not just at the, at the international level, as we've been discussing, but at the national level, having served as a senior officer in a retail food chain in the United States, helping build grocery stores in underserved areas across our country, and serving as the executive vice president, chief operating officer, for what is now Feeding America, what was then America's Second Harvest, mm -hmm. to support the, the ph philanthropic hunger needs of our communities. This is work that I've committed my life to. Didn't see it coming, but have seized every opportunity to work in this space because this, these issues are so critically important. And I've been blessed with the, an understanding of what's necessary, both in short term and long term, to help us address these issues. What is necessary? <laughs> <laughs> what is it? <laughs> well, do you remember the first time you saw a need? You know, like you saw hunger. You know, you grow up on, on Chicago's West Side and, and hunger takes a lot of different faces. Right. So sure, I saw kids come to school who hadn't had a meal when I was very, very young and didn't understand the impact of that. I grew up in a house with a grandmother where there was always another, enough room to put another chair at a table. Right. And so the recognizing that there were people in our community who didn't have access to food, we could bring them home. Mm. We could, you know, and, and we often did, yeah. uh, because we knew that 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 at, at at our house nobody ever went hungry. Sometimes you stretched meals mm -hmm. to ensure that you could fill every bowl, but nobody ever went hungry. And so th that importance was drilled into us, as I said, just not by what they said, but how my parents and my grandparents address these issues, both from our family as well as our community standpoint. And what I, what I then realized was, and I remember before I started working internationally, and I talked often about the challenges of hunger in the United States and how important they were, and that they were no less 
critical than they are in other parts of the globe until I went to and began to travel to other parts of the globe and to see acute hunger without the benefit of the types of social safety nets that we have in this country that, and without the capacity for communities to meet their own needs. But even in those cases, what I always saw was that neighbors where they could took care of other neighbors. Mm -hmm. You know, why this fundamental right? You know, there's a whole family of rights that you can see of need. You know, the internet's a human right, water's a human right, clean, fresh air is a human right. Why did this one grab you? Well, of course, there's a significant interconnectivity between all of those rights, water, food, hunger, energy. For to live a full and prosperous life, you can't extract one need out and say, I fixed this so the world is fine. You're absolutely right that we need to address those basic human needs in order to ensure that we as a, as a global community can continue to progress and prosper. I chose food because that's where I, food chose me. Uh, you know, I, I, I smile often because if you had asked me when I was graduating from law school, if I would spend much of my career addressing the availability, affordability, and the access to food, I, I probably would have looked at you sideways and what are you talking about? Right. But if opportunities continue to present themselves to me to make a difference. And as my skill set developed and those opportunities increased, I seized every single one of them. And to the question of what is it that we can do that yes. will that will make a difference. And, and that's much of the work that I am doing now. I had the benefit of after I left WFP, going out to Stanford for two years as a visiting fellow. And during that period, Rockefeller gave me a grant and BCG supported my work with a team of people to really perform a landscape study of what it would it take for us to address the challenges of creating market-based solutions to eliminating food insecurity. In other in other words, the reason you and I are not hungry today is because we can go into a store and, and afford to buy what is necessary. And it is not only affordable, it is available based upon the incomes that we have at hand. But there are many places, and you mentioned earlier, food deserts or places in sub-Saharan Africa where that's not the case. There's no ready availability because the businesses don't exist to ensure that there is a significant amount of those nutritious foods available and affordable. So how do we change that? We need to ensure that places, and let's just talk here about in the United States, their entire communities and really smart entrepreneurs that have started all kinds of businesses to provide access to more nutritious food. And that there are two ends of the spectrum. We're seeing alternative protein. We're seeing new types of cheeses and dairy products coming online that are healthier and better for you. They're often too expensive for the consumers who one would argue needs the most here at home, or they're not available because there are no grocery stores available. But now what we're seeing on the other end is we're seeing lots of small businesses coming online to address that affordability challenge, but there's no capital to scale those businesses. So what if we had the capital as well as the education and partnership support to drive the demand that was necessary to begin to ensure an equalization of opportunity of access of those more nutritious foods. And so we've started a nonprofit called Food Systems for the Future to prove that it's possible to provide market-based businesses in partnership with community organizations that drive education and advocacy about what is nutritious, what is a diverse diet, and making those foods more available and affordable that can change consumer demand. And when that demand is changed, it also ensures that not just the affluent, 
but those who struggle to purchase food also have the ability to buy those products. So do you have to affect that in multiple places at the same time in order to make it happen? Of course you do. So we have a team working here in the United States and a team working in Rwanda to demonstrate proof of concept. And, and how much capital does it take? Because is the hidden root, the hidden specter underneath all of these issues poverty? And you know how much capital does it take to put in place to ensure something like this could happen? One would argue that part of the challenge that we have, if we simply talk about the United States, is we have communities that have been redlined for investment opportunity. There's lack of jobs, there's lack of adequate housing, there's lack of grocery stores, there's lack of there's ineffective education. So I, I am not suggesting that simply growing more Black and Latinx to own food businesses across the food value chain will solve all of those problems. But that's why we need a commitment to making the kinds of investments across those, much like I was talking before about the inner connectivity of mm. addressing the issues that provide for prosperity of the base of human beings. The same is true in our communities where we see lack of growth and, and opportunity. We need to make those kinds of interconnected investments that will make the change that is required. I'm simply talking about one piece of that, and mm -hmm. that's the food insecurity pace. And that will give us an opportunity if we invest in, particularly in Black and Latinx entrepreneurs in these communities that can provide jobs, you're addressing the issue of access to capital or access to jobs, as well as access to capital for the business. And ultimately, you're also addressing that intergenerational wealth problem, mm -hmm. because we don't grow businesses in these communities that provide for the type of mainstay resiliency that is required for adequate and stable communities. So, you know, part of the challenge there, I mean, it's a banking problem on a certain level. And the, and the question is, there's a fundamental, say, lack of understanding about the, these two parties, the groups that want to borrow the money and the, and the people who have the money. How do we bridge that and bring them closer together? And how much money are we really talking about to pilot something like this? Well, what we're looking at to pilot it is about $25 million in the United States to invest in both the businesses that, that I've been talking about, but also in the partnerships, the policy changes, and the collaboration that is necessary to drive consumer demand. Because it's mm -hmm. not just enough to have more businesses that provide more affordable access to more nutritious food. It's also about driving consumer demand. And you, to your the, the point about money versus versus the opportunity, the, the issue that the asset owners, those money owners will, will point to is risk. And what we do then is de-risk that investment by providing the wraparound business operational support, as well as the partnership support that will ensure that we can make the financial returns that are necessary in those businesses mm -hmm. to attract the capital that you need, as well as the nutrition impact that we want to achieve to change the outcomes for these communities. And do you have to change policy in a given location to, to make this possible, to incentivize a a grocery store coming to a town? Do you have to, is there work to do on the policy side or is there no, it, it doesn't? It depends. It, it yeah. really depends. And what it requires is having people on the ground with an understanding of what are the hurdles mm -hmm. to business operation in those areas. Right. And have the capacity then to address those challenges, which is why it's proof of concept first in two particular markets, and then the ability to scale that up. My dream would be that we raise the 25 million mm -hmm. and we demonstrate the, the viability of this theory of change, and we can raise 200 million and expand to, to 10 cities mm -hmm. by the end of 2023. Then we're beginning to do something and that the country can say we are addressing these challenges in a significant and sustainable manner. All right. This is a call out to all of the billionaires that made so much money during the pandemic. Honest, honest to goodness. You know, I mean, it just seems like it's a story 
problem as well. You've got to be able to drive the narrative around why this is so essential. Just going back to Jesse's point about, you know, why food, you know, human right, right? Is the to me, it's the first one. I mean, without food, we're you can't do anything. Like, how can we change that story? I mean, it doesn't feel like that's a lot of money to raise for a pilot, right? It well, doesn't. Oh, I, I, I'm, I, as I sit here talking to you today, I can't name them yet, but we have two family foundations that we're going through due diligence with that'll potentially get us almost halfway there. And so I, I'm calling out to others to say, <laughs> and it's not just about Earth and Cousin who knows food and, and food security and policy mm -hmm. and partnerships and nutrition, but on our team, we also have financial experts who have spent their careers working in private equity and mm -hmm. and and VC so that because people often say Erthren, you know you know food but you don't know finance okay so if I went out and found and, and identified and yeah. brought into the organization those financial leaders to serve as the chief investment officer and manager of the fund itself and then what you have is the wraparound services as I've talked about the operating support the public the policy advocacy the policy partnership and then nutrition that grease the wheels for limiting the risk while supporting that financial return and a sustainable nutrition impact of our partner entrepreneurs. And in that, with that as our goal, yeah, I, I, I'm on your call out. To <laughs> now, <laughs> now why, why pick Rwanda as the other pilot and not Kenya or, you know, you know? I tell you why we chose Rwanda. Rwanda's small enough to work in. We could have a long conversation about the political challenges of Rwanda, but you mm -hmm. can't debate the commitment that the government has to making it easy to do business. Mm -hmm. And I have a direct access with the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Health, the President himself, as well as their, their uh, regulatory bodies. And so in Rwanda, what we're doing is looking at the entire poultry value chain mm -hmm. and how do we scale the commercial poultry value chain because egg consumption amongst children in Rwanda is the lowest on the continent mm -hmm. because of the lack of access to affordable feed. So we have an amazing project there where we are starting with addressing that issue, mm -hmm. working with a company in the Netherlands to create a black soldier fly company where we use bio waste to support the development of, a, of an alternative for soy, which mm -hmm. over time will reduce the cost of the feed and make the scaling of the commercial poultry value chain a reality. So we're, we're excited about the work that we're doing there. And all of that is happening in partnership with the government, as well as the businesses on the ground that we're working to invest in. So do you, when you're going to start a project like that, I mean, I imagine you've been working there for a while, but do you go in in this geographic region and you know go to the the church and and sit with the people and you know do you do what, what aspect does the community play either in the united states or rwanda in in these areas you're talking about in both places in any community that we work in rwanda we already have people on the ground in the in our targeted communities here in the united states we will hire people to work on the ground because partnership is key too often when we talk about communities, we talk about them as statistics or data, and we don't include their lived experiences in either the services that we bring or the results that we work to achieve. And that is how we fail. As development actors, as investors, that is how we fail. It is when we partner with those whose lives we are affecting, that we make the right decisions about how we move forward. So yes, conversations with at every level from government to NGOs to community actors is quite important wherever you work in the world. It is no different than a corporation that launches a new product and spends significant amounts of time doing the brand evaluation with potential customers and other stakeholders. 
stakeholders. Why would we, whether we're in the development community or the investment community, think that we can succeed if we do not connect with, communicate with, partner with, and drive our actions based upon the experience, the lived experience, and desires and demands of those that we serve? You know, are all problems, you know, you, you talked about this specific region, you know, in Rwanda, you know, are all problems scalable or all solutions scalable? You know, if it works there, does it have to work everywhere else? I would argue that the opportunity for scale is context dependent. The tools you use to scale in one place may yeah. serve as a guide, but should not be seen as a template. Because the again, back to those lived experiences, the government, the ecosystem, the policy ecosystem, the other com competition that you have on the ground for investment and for scaling any particular the value chain, all of those are context specific. So you're really bringing the humanity, right? And the specificity and the precision on the one hand, what is really going on in a community? What do they need? What kind of food do they like? How, whatever, what might work in that community? But it seems like the bigger ideal is, is completely scalable, but the detail, you know, which entrepreneurs coming in, what kind of food source, but the sort of model for scale seems like that could be uh, sort of more ubiquitous. Is that I, I, I exactly exactly okay. now when you sit down with um you know i'm thinking uh one of warren buffett's kids is very connected you know his charity is you know his farm things right but just any any high-end uh or not even high-end just any when you're when you're trying to explain the idea to people is it hard to get them to understand no it's not particularly i like the way you say warren buffett <laughs> He Not his name, be. Paul, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> whatever his name is. And, you know. and I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. And, he, he and you're invited to join this project. Yeah. <laughs> he is, he is very, he's he's a, very I consider him a friend. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, yeah. and he is someone that when I was at WFP was very supportive of my work there. Mm -hmm. The reality is that many of the asset owners are, are quite interested in addressing issues of nutrition, of food insecurity, of the wealth gap in the United States, the issues re regarding intergenerational poverty. E everyone, particularly over the last two years, there's been an explosion in interest in supporting these issues. The challenge that we have is that we are a new organization, but I would say we overcome the newness of our enterprise by the strength of the experiences of the team that we have organized and developed and that is working on these issues. You know, together from a food security standpoint, we probably have over 400 years of experience yeah. <laughs> combined all of our experience together. And so our challenge is getting in the door to share our, our theory of change, our, our investment strategy, and working with and, and identifying those asset owners, asset managers who recognize the potential that our team brings to actually developing solutions that can scale. For me, success would be that we prove that the this idea of providing the investment capital and then those wraparound services that I was talking about does reduce risk and support the companies achieving their financial goals and making the nutrition impact to the point where capital flows into the space and others begin to do the work that we do. It is not just about Earthren wanting to see FSF, Food Systems for the Future, grow. I want to see others come in and mimic what we're doing and capital flowing to whomever in order to achieve these goals. That Because we need the, the types of large infusions of capital that change the risk factors that organizations are using that limit the investments that are happening today you know there's more capital than one can imagine flowing around the earth right now mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of money around there so it's a question of how to get it into these tentacles you know all sorts of tentacles you know is the idea that you know we talk about the return on capital but 
isn't it enough just if the capital is returned? Does it have to make a huge profit on top of the number two? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know any asset owner or asset manager that walks into an investment Mm -hmm. that they are that they are making as opposed to a philanthropic contribution that they mm -hmm. are providing where they don't look for some financial return i am not going to suggest mm -hmm. that we are going to make the kind of financial return of a tech business in silicon valley mm -hmm. but we have a responsibility to make a reasonable financial return of 2x or 3x on the capital that is invested and in some cases, it may be that we are investing convertible debt that where the risk is higher so that we're protecting the capital through the, a, a debt vehicle that we can that we can convert to an equity investment once the business reaches a certain set of milestones. Now, you said at the beginning, it's a nonprofit. So doesn't philanthropy play a role? You know, can't it play a role alongside the, you know, and there's all the layers of different kinds of debt and investment and you know, when we when we uh, we take the risk apart, you know, you could layer the risk in all sorts of different ways. No, I welcome philanthropic capital. <laughs> we should have a diverse capital stack and some mm -hmm. of it may be grant capital mm -hmm. as well as debt or equity capital in order to support and minimize the risk of that equity capital that we bring in. You're absolutely right. We welcome philanthropic capital and indeed for the Institute for us to provide the wraparound services, we also need to raise a budget on a regular basis to support the performance of that work. And that's mm -hmm. all philanthropic rapid cap yeah it um, just excite you to see what is coming forward in terms of ideas to solving this so the entrepreneurs that are everywhere and they don't have to come from a fancy school or a fancy mm -hmm, place mm -hmm. just that ingenuity that that at least jesse and i have had the opportunity to meet with people around the world a lot in in and all over the continent of africa people are just coming up with mind-blowing ideas how important is is that as well because the, the you know a lot of times it's young people wanting to, to mm -hmm. solve problems. What do you have, any thoughts around that? I, I think you're spot on. And that's why the, the explosion of incubators, accelerators and X prizes that have come online are, are so in demand today because these Gen Zers, they think, they believe wholeheartedly that they can solve the problems. They're not waiting for us to give them the chance inside of our large organizations. They're starting their own and building their own solutions using these facilities that are, that are available to them to bring new ideas online. And so we have developed and are continuing to develop relationships with those incubators and accelerators because that may be where many of those in our pipeline where we identify those that go into our pipeline that we watch over time. And at some point we may see them as an opportunity for us to help them scale as they grow and move forward. So, you know, in the distant future, you know, how will you look back and measure this personally? What would be an outcome that you would look back and say that was very satisfying? You know, I was asked a similar question yesterday and it forced me to, to, to spend some time thinking about this. And so they're, they're on a couple levels of how I would measure success. And first is on programmatic success, that we can identify companies where they are 10 years from now at a level where they are operating at uh, the capacity that allowed them to make uh, significant, in my dreams, double digit annual returns. And they're employing people and they're providing more nutritious food and they're providing it at a price where those in the community who are demanding more nutritious foods can actually afford it and are buying it. That to me would be from a, from a business standpoint point, a significant success. A significant success is those asset owners and managers that take a risk with us and come in on this venture have seen a return on their capital that makes them acknowledge the value of the investments that they made, not just for their financial return, but for their human return of affecting the prosperity and the health of, of the communities in which we live. And then from 
the standpoint of myself as an individual, you know, in 10 years, I'm the, over 70 years old. And this enterprise is at a point where I've handed it over to one of our young leaders who is, will lead the organization into greater heights and providing more resources and support. And we become recognized as a facility that makes a difference in addressing the issues of creating a just and sustainable food system, but also in providing for the prosperity of all of the actors across that food system. And will you return to Lawndale at that point? <laughs> you know, my mom sold the house in Lawndale. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> about five years ago. Yeah. And so I live now in Hyde Park. I, oh, I nice. still visit and, and have friends yeah. in Lawndale. And it's like anyone who has a hometown or a home community it will always have a special place in my heart. Well, and that, that dinner table is just going to be bigger and bigger. When you were talking just <laughs> yeah. now, I just imagine a kind of a global dinner table, which is really kind of what I was thinking um, with lots of opportunity. Um, we are just so happy and grateful that you came to talk to us. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank and you very much. Just to let everybody know again, the name of your, of the, of the Institute of the organization. It's food systems for the future. Okay. Nice. Arthur, and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Be safe. And thank you for thank everything you. you're doing. All right. Very much Bye. appreciate the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye you guys.